If I put sentence on my resume that I am expert in client server architecture, probably I won't get the job. Nobody even look at me. How do you think I feel when I put mainframe on there? Oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> Not I had a request for mainframe with Next. Ansible a couple of weeks ago. It is 400, baby. Yeah, so this is, this is so yesterday. The client server was great back in 90s, 2000. Not anymore. People moved away from client server into the microservices, and this is what driving the architecture. This is what the um, new applications are um, using today. It is based on those magic 12 factors, and factor number six says application has to be using stateless services where, which store state on the persistent storage. Stateless services that store data on persistent storage. To me, this sounds like a stateful application. And a matter of fact, Kubernetes, when it <coughs> was introduced, it was introduced primarily for stateless applications. What industry discovered that 90% of the applications are stateful. They need state to be pre preserved across the boots, across the instances. And soon enough, Kubernetes community realized that, hey, we need to have storage connected to the Kubernetes. Um, but let me go back and discuss the reasons why Kubernetes came up, what really triggered uh, Kubernetes popularity. One of the reasons was that Kubernetes density is much higher than VM density, right? So by at least factor, one factor, if we can have 20 VMs, 50 VMs running on the, on the host, we can have 200 Kubernetes um, pods running on a single node. So significantly higher density. The other reason is performance. It takes a couple of minutes to start a new VM. Kubernetes can start a new pod within milliseconds. So that definitely is another huge advantage. So this means that I can scale is using Kubernetes, I can scale my application up and down based on the workload, based on the needs. This is awesome. I can have streaming services scaling on demand based on the amount of customers I have. I don't have to plan, do a capacity planning a week or month in advance to know how many customers or anticipate how many customers will be watching my video or going to my online store. I can easily have spare capacity available, and this capacity will be consumed whenever my application needs it. That's beautiful. <coughs> On the left-hand side, we see a couple of things here. Right? So we have this, just very briefly, um, we have Kubernetes cluster, which includes master node and worker nodes. So those are the terms you'll hear me using. On the right-hand side, we see number of commercial distribu Kubernetes distributions that um, are available today. All of them quite popular. Let's go back to the storage need. So as I mentioned earlier, 90% of the applications are stateful. Initially, when it all started, every container orchestrator had their own specification, right? So Kubernetes had their own, um, Docker Swarm had their own um, way to connect external storage. <coughs> and soon real, they realized that they can't scale, they can't maintain those many interfaces. So all of them got together, plus the storage vendors piled in, and we all developed a thing called CSI, Container Storage Interface, which was announced GA November 2018. <coughs> and it's a beautiful thing because 
finally, everybody got together, everybody worked together, and developed a spec, it's easy and simple to be consumed, that really addresses the needs of today's consumers, developers, and today's applications. Let's look at uh, the CSI spec. Very simple, has two personas, a developer and the admin, which can be storage admin, which can be Kubernetes admin, network admin. So a developer is really a consumer that has control when volume will be, will be provisioned and how large the volume will be provisioned. It's beautiful, right? So I can provision the volume on demand when I need it, the size I need it. I don't have to wait until my storage admin comes and tells me, yes, your volume is ready, or no, you have to wait another week to, do, um, to get your volume. Perfect. On the other hand, the spec also allows storage admin to set the quotas and limits and set control elements on the, on, on the capacity that can be allocated for developer. And this is managed through the storage class. So developer provisions persistent volumes, also called as PVs, which essentially are grouped in the storage class and um, linked to the LUNs on the storage array. So all this workflow automat is automated by CSI plugin. Um, and we have integration for all the storage arrays. So any workloads that you have, or our customers have, will have integration with the storage arrays. Can I ask you a question? Yep. Uh, so you have a CSI plugin for each single platform, meaning that uh, if I have a cluster, a large cluster accessing resources in the backend, you, you, you have to uh, access all the resources in the backend independently, okay? So I, I propose all the, I, sorry, I, I show all my storage system to the cluster and it becomes quite complicated because uh, when I ask a resource, how do I match with the right? Uh, it's all abstracted within the CSI driver. Yeah. So CSI okay. driver, so you use storage classes to, to also define the type of array that you want. Yeah. Exactly. You use storage class to define the policy that you want or um, um, the array that you want. And this is essentially, you allow storage admin to set a quota to limit the amount of space allocated for that storage class, which storage array so that has to go You have a CSI to. plugin at the end and uh, something that uh, understands all the storage classes, everything you have in the backend, right. and can make choices on what is better. Exactly. So if I have, a, a, I don't know, 20 uh, unity arrays in mm -hmm. the backend, how does it, it chooses the right resource uh, uh, that I need? So I don't want, of course, not to point at array number 13. I yeah. want it automatically, I get enough capacity from the array that has the right characteristics and uh, uh, enough. Uh, uh. So this is a placement problem I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. Um, we working on it. Okay. As of today, storage class points to a specific storage array. So if you have five storage arrays, you'll have five storage classes. <coughs> OK. And the other thing is, that one of the biggest issues that I found talking with customers adopting this kind of technology is that their array was not designed for Kubernetes. I mean, in, in many cases, it's just like that uh, uh, they need uh, 100 uh, volumes mm -hmm. in sudden, and the backend is not ready to provision 100 volumes. And these volumes disappear after five minutes. So that the, the, the allocation of the resources is another <coughs> work. And it becomes harder and harder to keep with, uh, with the space. So uh, how do you manage this kind of uh, solution if you can point to a one array at a time? So we, we OK, um, long story short, I'm getting signs. OK. 
All right. So uh, to answer your question, yes, the Kubernetes drives new use cases. And those new use cases essentially drive changes within APIs. Yes, those APIs have to be adjusted. We're working closely with the platform teams to adjust APIs to meet the new requirements, new workflows. Um, there are certain limitations that apply for each array, but those are being worked on and we, uh, we will be addressing. As of today, we do have integration with each and every storage array. The scale um, or the performance of provisioning varies from the array to array. And as I said, we're working on improving that, um, that, that provisioning performance. Sorry, the, I'll talk to the array that I'm most familiar with, which is the Paramax and how the, uh, the API works on that, is that it has automatic LUN selection. So even if you, you know, you're doing these deep provisioning uh, exercises, once the label's cleared off the LUN, uh, that LUN is available then for reselection and provisioning out again. So you get, uh, you know, you don't have the, the scale up, scale down, it can be quite quite fast for that. So there is really fast volume. Uh, it looks like volume creation to the... The same LAN. So I, I release the LAN, and the LAN is ready for another system. Yeah. So the... Uh, I mount the LAN, and the LAN uh, has data in it? Yeah, that, that will... Uh, you can do the uh, the free operations as part of that, and uh, where the, where the uh, space is free back up to the pools. <coughs> But the uh, the lawn itself can be reused if it's on the on the off the right size. Do, do you also do you already support uh, the the snapshot functionality that is available in CSI? But uh, yes, we do for some arrays. Um, there's a word of caution. The snapshot was it's tough. I know. It's very new. And not tough. It's new. Um, the snapshot has been an alpha phase for more than a year. In fact, for probably a year and a half. Um, one, version 117 promoted snapshot to beta. So it's in the member, right? Uh, fairly new. We're working, we um, support snapshot with the alpha APIs. And a, you may or may not know that APIs in beta changed. They're not backward compatible. So we will have to update our drivers to support um, the latest version of the snapshot APIs. But yes, we are working adding snapshot capabilities across the board. And, and of course, because you are at this state, there is no way to configure uh, remote replication automatically. So if I need a disaster recovery for my Kubernetes cluster and I want to be sure that all the <coughs> data is replicated in secondary site, so there are solutions that are already able to, to tell me you know, to take consistently data from a Kubernetes cluster on yeah. a standard, right. on a secondary side. Yes. I know that there are other complications, because, but, but you know. Uh, yeah. So those, those solu solutions are usually delivered and very relevant for software defined storage. And we, adding, we will be adding such capability to our software defined storage products. For the hardware based products, this is, um, let's say, Less Can you specify the name of the uh, software defined storage? Uh, VxFlex OS. Okay. The, the, where you, can, you have a cluster that is replicated, that uh, scales across but, multiple but, sites. Okay. I get it. But, but this is not what I. I mean, it's very expensive. Right. Yeah. So I, it is expensive. So usually what happens, and this. So I'm not suggesting. You don't plan to, to support uh, then. Replication of lines uh, across different environments. We're looking into this. We have not received a single request for this. Um, well, but 99% of the enterprises are still in a very early phase of adoption of Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. I tend, tend to agree with you. But as soon as you know these kind of organizations start to using Kubernetes seriously, some of them are already asking for it. Yeah. Right, right. So we're looking into, into providing replication. We feel that it's a little bit too early. We went, uh, the, CS, the CSI doesn't have provision for replicated storage yet. So those have to be custom resource uh, definitions. Um, we're looking where the industry moves, whether 
this use case becomes relevant for Kubernetes? And if so, definitely we'll add this capability. And I'm sorry to interrupt very quickly. You've just talked about you've got the experience of the PowerMax side of, of doing this. Uh -huh. um, what do you do in terms of metadata? So imagine I've got an environment where I'm provisioning LUNs up and they're being mapped to pods, yeah. and then my container environment dies, and I, I now, now have a load of LUNs sitting on my storage array that I now need to map to work out what they were for at the time. What metadata do you push down to the array in order to be able to identify that? Uh, is, that come, is that something you're going to discuss? Right, that's on, uh, that's on, the, the, on the CSI driver's side, the metadata orders. Um, you mean metadata? Well, oh, the thing is, you, for the very controller. beginning of this presentation, you said um, the definition was to have stateless applications on persistent storage. Right. So the most logical place to put the metadata that maps yeah. what that data is for is on the persistent storage because yeah. it's the only thing that's persistent because the container environment could die and be de and be lost or re reinstalled or whatever. So if you do that, you need to have a way of working out what that what those LUNs were originally used for, Think and therefore you need to metadata on the to make to, to make that association. Yeah. Uh, so what do you push down from the array? So I this Florian's on the uh, F Florian and Brian are on the back end there who are our Kubernetes. Uh, to take it offline. Yeah, no, we'll definitely get we'll offline. definitely get back to so it on that one. Long story uh, short, uh, we don't back at CD. So this, um, this type of metadata, Kubernetes metadata is stored on etcd. So if I lose my etcd cluster, I've, I'm, I'm lost in terms of my association between the array but and the... That's why it is better to store it uh, on the SAN. But if you store etcd metadata on the local hard drive, that's a possibility. So looking at the architectural considerations, those are the three type of architectures that we see um, mostly. And I'm not suggesting one or, uh, is better than the other, but um, it's the architectural considerations for connecting storage, external storage to the Kubernetes are really based on the type of infrastructure that Kubernetes is using. If Kubernetes is deployed on the bare metal or physical servers, definitely the only way to connect a storage array is through the CSI driver. Um, if Kubernetes is running on the virtual environment, vSphere, there is a CNS driver. So CNS driver essentially is a CSI driver that talks to Kubernetes through the CSI APIs and maps um, a storage class to the data store. It, I call it semi-dynamically provisioned storage because data store has to be pre-provisioned. The VMDKs will be, or volume requests, will be placed on the data store, but data store has to be made available before um, storage class is created. And the last architecture is hybrid art infrastructure, uh, where we have CSI driver, again, talking directly from Kubernetes to the external storage array, um, bypassing virtualization layer. Because in the hybrid environment, we see customers using, um, say, master nodes being on the virtual environment and then working nodes on bare metal. So they anticipate that this way they'll get high performance and things like that. So could you, could you tell us, because this is, this is great, and it looks like you're thinking through like all the stuff that needs to be thought through. And if I'm a customer and I've got one of your arrays, instead of this being, why, you know, it, it's a good way for me to, to maybe um, reclaim some of my technical debt to do things this new way, right? But can you walk us through like a real customer implementation? Like here's a problem they solved with an application they were building using Kubernetes, and here's how the storage piece actually fits in. Do you have, how about do you... I, I'll show you a, a demo. Okay, is it gonna show me from the application all the way back? Okay, cool, that's what I wanna see. I really see customers with master nodes, the VMs and worker nodes is bare metal. We, um... I hear customers talking about this architecture. I haven't seen anybody using it, but I heard multiple ones planning to, to have this architecture. Okay, so this is the slide that shows driver architecture. And the purpose of the slide is not to dive deep in how the driver works. The purpose of the slide is to reassure you and community of storage admins, that the, the driver is ready to be used in production, that Kubernetes is stable enough, that our CSI drivers are ready to be used in the production environment. Some customers 
ask me question, is the driver stable, robust enough? Is the driver safe enough? How the communication between the driver and the storage array happens? Can I trust the Kubernetes admin uh, with my username and password? So all those type of questions come up. So from the security perspective, on the driver and the Kubernetes or <coughs> kube admin, um, driver and Kubernetes work through the Unix socket. Then on the lower level, the array-specific libraries are talking to the storage array through the REST APIs. REST APIs go through HTTPS, secure layer. Um, the authentication with the storage array is done through encrypted token. So the storage admin has to give a, a user or essentially a token that has encrypted information about the user capable of provisioning storage in the storage array. So this demo, I'm going to demonstrate Kubernetes use of persistent storage that is stored on the Farmax storage array. <coughs> I'm going to demonstrate the CI-CD pipeline using uh, Kubernetes and GitLab. GitLab will have my CI CD pipeline delivered. So let's look at the environment that I have. I have a simple uh, Kubernetes cluster with three nodes, Kubernetes version 115 installed. And this is what I'm going to use. I'm going to take a simple to do application which tracks um, to do items. Okay? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to um, create master or rather a production environment and development environment. The application is using SQLite database, which is stored on the Parmax array, okay? So that's my persistent storage. Has to be persistent across the changes that I'm gonna make. So I'm gonna use um, GitLab to create a CI-CD pipeline, and this is uh, uh, my CI-CD definition, I have two stages. I have build stage, where I will be making changes, building my application, and deploy stage. I will be, I'll have two environments, development environment and the master environment. So when I will build the, my binaries, I will build two binaries, one for <coughs> uh, the master, which will have um, to do's uh, latest, the tag, and I'll build uh, one for development, which will have to do's plus the branch name. And I also have well, deploy um, workflow here. So I use Helm charts to deploy my application. Essentially, what build does, build takes the application, compiles it, creates a Docker image, puts it to the repository, and once the um, deploy stage is invoked, it pulls the data from that Docker image uh, from the repository and creates an environment and deploys in the environment. So this is my uh, Helm chart manifest. I'm going through this quickly. If you want me to stop and explain something, let me know. Okay, okay. okay. And this is my uh, environment, um, deploy environment. Okay, so I'm gonna deploy this in the um, to do's, to do's DB plus uh, branch name volume, and I'm gonna show you the pvc.yaml. So this is um, the instructions or the YAML file for storage uh, for our driver to provision 2 GB volume on the Parmax storage class. All right, so I'm gonna build that image and when deploying in the new environment, I will have to create this um, persistent volume on this uh, Parmax storage array. So let's look at the production uh, instance. So I have production instance and I have the studio application running. Look at the title, right? So it's a great title. I'm adding a, a record there just to show that I have this. Um, this is, indicates that this is production instance. Now I'm creating a branch called colors, all right? So, and I'll be changing the color of the title to something yellowish. Okay, I'm saving the file, uh, committing the change, uh, will be pushing that, that change, meaning 
building the image. And this is what I have. I have colors branch, all right? So the, let's build uh, the image. So once the build is complete, I will start uh, deploying it. So let's deploy it. This is the time when a persistent volume is uh, being created on the Parmax storage array. All right, so once uh, deployment is completed, okay, I see this is the storage classes I show. And this is, uh, those are the two volumes that I have, one for production, uh, to do is DB latest, and one for uh, development, to do is DB colors. Right, so two volumes, both of them are on the PowerMax storage. All right, so, Deployment is completed. Now I've got to development branch. I run the instance of Todo's application. Tada! I have Todo's in in the yellow. So my changed work. Let's add some data to the persistent storage. So it's just a couple of things, to just to show that in, while I'll be making the changes on my application, I'll be changing the color of the title again. The data will persist. I will change to color to pink, will commit the change, will push the change, will start the build process, um, the, will start the deploy process. The difference between this deployment and the earlier deployment that I'll be reusing existing persistent storage, existing one that I created them. You're just changing the application. I'm just changing uh, the application and reusing the same persistent uh, storage, the same lens. So when we're seeing that being created, th this is actually an example that if I have a, a web app that has a database mm -hmm. and you're, you're deploying it to test, but you're also deploying it to pride, and when it's deploying, it's actually assigning the storage and building the database. Is that what's happening? <sighs> the build process is taking the code compiling it, creating a container image, pushing it to the container repository, mm -hmm. and that's it. Okay. Then deploy process pulls that image from the uh, container repo and deploys in, the, in my um, development environment. Mm -hmm. So once the image is deployed, the container image is deployed in my development environment, I should be able to run the application and should be able to see the changes. Okay, so for this to work, and, and just tell me if I'm wrong, the storage was already the first signed. time. The first time I created the colors branch, I, when I changed to the yellow, there was no storage available. Mm -hmm. So I had to build it in the environment. And so that's what, okay, that's what I'm asking. So, right. should, okay. So the first time the environment was built, the next time when I changed the color to pink, I was reusing the same existing environment that was created okay. the gotcha. first step. Okay. Okay. So this shows that this, the persistent storage does work. The records that I created the first step does it, do exist, but the color changed. So my code changed, the color changed. So, but the. So could I have something similar to this if I was doing some kind of. HPC or ML application where I have a data set existing on an array and right. I want to copy that someplace else so that I can tag it or test it. Would, would this kind of thing work for that? Well, that's a slightly different use case. The use case that we looking at here is that the first time when I had a yellow color, I had one instance, one mm -hmm. container. So this indicates that we the life cycle of the container and life cycle of the storage are different. So I can have storage connected to the first container, and when <coughs> I change the application, I discard that first container, put the second container, and attach my storage to that container. Make okay. sense? Got it. So what you're saying is slightly different. So you want to create multiple copies of the data, so essentially have a gold copy use case. Thus, this use case is also covered uh, through the snapshot um, workflow. Okay. In Kubernetes, I can create a snapshot and then create volume using that snapshot or volumes using okay. that snapshot. I don't have this as a demo. No, no. no. What, what happens if I want to pick up that um, 
that second example where you reuse the, the, the data. Uh -huh. um, <coughs> and now I run it, want to run it in a different site. How do I then, I could replicate the volume with SRDF or something like that, but how do I then get that back, that volume map back into um, my new um, Kubernetes cluster in a different location uh, so that I know that it's that volume that I want to use for that application that's now going to run mm -hmm. in a different data center? Yeah, uh, so Kubernetes have a concept called, or CSI rather, has a concept called topology, um, which says that volume, which basically limits resource use, use within defined zones. Um, we, not, we don't have support for zones yet. We're looking and doing this. And uh, the use case is very similar to re replication use case. Um, again, so one, on one side, we, we're still early in adopting Kubernetes, meaning our customers are still in the early stages of adopting Kubernetes. We're not seeing much of the uh, requirement, but this may come up. On the other hand, this specific use case we see is more, as more relevant for um, sort of defined storage type of products, uh, VxPlex OS in our case. And this is probably going to be the first one that we will be um, de developing support for. Okay. I mean, that's sort of, this sort of extends what Gene was saying about the analytics stuff where you might have a lot of data that you want to mm -hmm. run analytics yeah. against. Yeah. You might want to snap it and run it somewhere else or you might just run out of capacity in your own data center and want to shift it somewhere else right. to run it. So that portability of the data, it, it, persistent data, seems to be, I would expect, an upcoming rather important sort of feature to add. Yeah. That's, uh, well, that very much depends on the way Kubernetes cluster is um, built. We're not seeing, at least I haven't seen, and I'm not saying that I know everything, it seems to me that Kubernetes clusters are built locally. So you may have multiple clusters, one in one data center, another in another data center, but those will be different clusters. Yeah. But you would use something, what you're implying is that you would use something like an object store and push the data back into the object yeah. store and have to pull it back out mm -hmm. in the other location, something like that. But and, and moving persistent storage across clusters is an interesting use case. And this is... Um, how does the uh, persistent volume scale? So if, uh, if the container, for instance, is going to be automatically scaled to be you know, twice as number of containers and stuff like that, where's uh -huh. the persistent volume associated with that container pod? How does that get scaled? I mean, does it just get duplicated, or is it going to be pointing to the same volume? Or so, Well, if volume, if a pod requires more capacity, there is a volume expand um, capability within CSI. So this essentially allows volume to be expanded. I'm not talking about capacity as much as, let's or, say, performance. Let's say you're, right, you know, you're driving 1,000 users on this to-dos application. So you want to go from one container pod to 20. Fine. You can go. Um, question is, do ev does every new pod require separate persistent storage, or they will require the same persistent storage? That's the, that, that's that's the, the critical question, question yeah. right? Yeah. So if they do require access to the same storage, then we're talking about um, NFS, file system, because access mode is going to be read, write, many, or RWX. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, this access mode is only available for um, NFS. And NFS performance is not that great compared to the block storage. Okay. So I think the, the other thing is, is like data gravity is a real thing yeah. as well, right? Yeah. So, you know, I think that's one of the problems people have, you know, if, if they've already created all this data and now we have all sorts of ways to create all the new data, mm -hmm. which is forcing us to have new applications. It would be really interesting to do some of the things both of these guys talked about, you know, being able to snap that data to a different place to be yep. able to work on it, do analytics on it, create new things from it, create meaning from it, and do it really quickly so that people get the best out of, you know, where they've already invested and have all their data living. Right. You know, so that, that it sounds really like you guys are on a good start for it, so it's exciting. Well, that's a good feedback. Thank you. 
All right, any other questions? Shall I continue? Okay. So essentially where we are right now is um, I made another change to, okay, uh, to pink and the change did happen. The, it, uh, the new container was attached to the existing volume and this is what that uh, indicates. All right. What the part that I missed that um, we have quota support in Kubernetes and quota support allows Kubernetes admins to control the amount of capacity that they allocate for developers. Remember developers are now in charge of provisioning LUNs, no, stor no storage admins. L developers provisioning LUNs and in order to put the boundaries for them so they don't just consume entire available storage, Storage admin will be creating quotas and setting the limits how much they will allocate for them to use. Um, this is indication that we have integration for any possible workloads that you can imagine. Okay, so we're still working on replication. That's a use case that we noodling on. But any type of workloads that our customers have are available to be um, executed using so, LEMC storage. So these work on vSphere as well as bare metal? The CSI driver bypasses vSphere. CSI driver assumes, as I mentioned in the earlier slide, that uh, it's good. Well, although it can work with vSphere, but it bypasses vSphere. It doesn't really talk. We, I saw instances of Kubernetes deployed on the virtual environment, but um, storage connected through the CSI driver. I do not anticipate this is going to be widely widely used, but it does. That option does exist. So, would the CSI driver then be incompatible with Project Pacific? No. The CSI driver is not incompatible with Project Pacific. CSI driver can coexist okay. if designers choose so. Um, I do anticipate that with Project Pacific, people will tend to, will fall, will be using CNS, which is native to vSphere driver, rather than CSI driver. But that's uh, and that will work easy. with all of the storage arrays. That will work with all the storage arrays. Okay. Any concerns? Yeah, my understanding is that vSphere is all is has left CNS and has all gone to CSI for PKS and uh, they left PKS. The CNS they left, they left CNS and are using CSI for for Kubernetes PKS solutions on. Uh, and I was specifically talking about Project Pacific. I understand, but Pacific is the next generation. This PKS this PKS Plus, right? I think it's different. But yeah, yeah it's, not PKS. <laughs> it's not PKS plus. It's it's just the control plane in vSphere. So that's what the question was. Can if you if you use the native Kubernetes, which is what will be embedded into ESXi, can you use that with CSI? But he answered that question. Okay, very quickly, two more minutes. Oh yeah, it's all yours. <laughs> I was getting used to not talking uh, for once. Okay, so um, like, probably just wrapping up, uh, we just want to talk a little bit about the community that we're, that we're working on. Specifically, Audrius uh, is uh, heading this up to try and get uh, more people talking, exchanging ideas. Similar to what we've done with our community forums, we're doing that for the DevOps. So uh, the story source page that I put up earlier um, is uh, going to be the place where we're going to be directing people. Um, we're monitoring it, uh, product management are monitoring it, and the developers are monitoring it that are building these tools. So it's a good place to get, get information, get access to everything that we talked about today, including, actually, I think the video for that, uh, that, you, that you showed, you'll see the other part uh, at the end of that as well. But really, we just want to get our customers talking, uh, look at things a little bit differently. Um, we're basically here to help. Um, so thanks again, guys, for Wait a minute. So what's the URL? I can't believe you guys don't have a URL on here. <laughs> so oh, I had it up in the storage <laughs> source. Story source. LEMC.com slash storage source. Yeah. And that's what this is? That's yeah. what this is. Yeah. Excellent. Sorry. 
Will add that on. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe Pause. it. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much, guys. Thank you.